Hello and welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast. I'm your host, Christina Rowett, and today on the show, to go deep on his history as a fan is Stone Goss out of Pearl Jam. It's an exciting moment to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited oh, to be here. It's a nice time. Where um, are you? I'm in, I'm in Sydney, Australia. Okay. Yeah. Great. It's, it's bright and early. Um, this is yeah. my time to connect with the United States. I, yeah, I like it's a great city. Yeah, so, it is a great city. Such amazing. Going to the beach there, it's like, wow, you can just go to the beach in the city. You, you really can. We do. You're in the city and then you're just at the beach. And it's we like, do win that, the city race. The rest of the country does resent us for that. And I'm, yeah. fine, I'm fine with yeah. it. Um, so first question is always the same, which is who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? Gary Wright. Okay, tell me more. My Love is Alive or Dreamweaver. I think I just, I had a babysitter that like had eight tracks and like came over and pl and played those two songs right when they, I think they were probably singles and pop radio singles at that time. And I was just like, wow, what the hell is that? That's amazing. Gary Wright, that's my guy, I said to myself. How old are you? 55. Wait, no, no, how old are you then? Oh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like to say it took a second, I'm like, oh. It was, <laughs> it was probably 50 years ago. Yeah, well. I don't know when Love is Alive came out, so I'm, I'm gonna say it's, you know, I was, maybe I was eight, or maybe I was, you know, literally five. Maybe it was exactly 50 years ago to the day. That's pretty amazing. Like, yeah. and it's cool to have it still have a vivid memory of it, that that was your guy. Like, yeah. did you want to play music at that point? No, uh, I, uh, maybe, I, I, I think I wanted to play trumpet or something. There was, you know, yeah, I was interested in it, but it was listening to radio kind of in my, you know, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, hearing FM, you know, just snippets of pop radio and mostly pop radio, you know, like easy listening sort of 70s pop. But yeah. Well, this is the thing you know, an age in a golden age for radio, really. Like the 70s, the, there's, yeah. there's some interesting stuff that happened and it's interesting yeah, totally. what happened 20 years later. Like, okay, so who was the first artist you saw yourself in? Um, I don't know that I, you know, I don't know that I'm seeing myself in artists, but I saw artists that I was like, that's cool. And I want to kind of try to do something like, or, you know, or yeah. even without thinking, I want to try to do something like that. I just started doing something like that without even, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to rip you off, but at the same time, I don't even, you know. Yeah, totally. It feels perfectly natural to do that. To you. <laughs> Everyone knows. <laughs> as, um, as, um, Nate from Converge once said, anyone who says that their music is original is a fucking liar. That, that is, yeah. it's, everything comes from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, pardon my French, it's fine. So, uh, so you know, starting to play guitar, didn't, I didn't really play guitar until 16, but like, you know, so I didn't think of myself as being someone who's gonna be a musician, didn't really think like that was even possible. And by the time I picked up a guitar, it was only because you know, there was enough kids at art school going, fuck it, you know, I want to, you know, play guitar and make a noise band or, you know, or bands like, you know, the Talking Heads or bands like um, these do-it-yourself 80s, you know, punk rock, but meets, you know, the next thing of like, it just, you know, anybody's got a chance to do this kind of spirit. And that's what was going on in terms of the friends that I had that were starting bands at that time. So, you know, it was punk, but then it was noise, but then it was, you know, German noise, but then it was, you know, like every sub genres of people talking about things that they were interested in. I was excited about that and excited about the fact that, you know, that it was breaking down music to be accessible to me, which was like, I don't know how to play music. I don't know the first thing about music, but my friends in a band and they wrote a song and it was cool. And, and I've got another friend who's telling me that, you know, it, you kind of intentionally almost be shitty because it's better if you're not, if you're not too, you know, that was intriguing, like, you know, that somebody who was, you know, an amateur could do something, you know, uh, compelling in a song without having done anything you know, in terms of rigor. 
Well, it is funny that later on that you copped a lot for um, being a particularly competent player amongst a lot of people who weren't. Like people like, he's too good as a guitar player. He's far too good. This is a problem. <laughs> it's true. I, I've done the same thing with guitar from the get-go, which is just yeah. literally pick it up and stumble around on it. I have no idea. I know the notes now in terms of like, if somebody shows me chords, I can, you know, follow along, but my ear in terms of like being able to kind of decipher something or harmonically break it down into like chords, minor, major, all that. It's a complete mystery to me still. So wow. um, my, my abilities are very sort of one dimensionally, but honed kind of one dimensionally into this, like, I know what I like and I'm going to go, no, 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 and that's going to be my part yeah you made a sound. It's, it's cool to make a sound you go you made a sound yeah. you know yeah, with your with your voices i always think guitars are like another voice and you've got quite a chorus of voices in your band like you know it's it's i don't know if you've ever felt like that like in terms of another voice as a mute yeah. as an as a instrument in your yeah, band like or whatever. yeah 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 it's got it's yeah, some yeah. Sort of other thing it it's takes like, a lot of trust it takes a lot of trust it's like and you got to be loved but you know for me to be a good player, I got to almost kind of be loved by the people that are playing with me to kind of accept my idiosyncratic, you know, behavior, but also see that it's kind of does something good. So it's it's a trust exercise. And if you can kind of find your love for your flawed, you know, fellow uh, musicians or not flawed in lots of cases, me, you know, you know, you know, encouraging them encouraging them to be the, all they can be and that, that as long as there's kind of room for you to kind of be yourself that's kind of this you know zone you can kind of it's yeah you actually have a happy band marriage like well i mean i actually i have no idea what the internals are but from the exterior it is rare to have a band almost have the complete same lineup for as long as you have yeah. that's yeah. pretty nuts did you does it have anything to do with what you're a fan of when you started out and has that stayed consistent or is it just you guys? Yeah, I think so. I think we all love bands and we were all sad when they broke up and we all, you know, long for that period of time where they were all just, you know, it's like the Beatles or, you know, whoever's breaking up. It's like, you can't make the Beatles again. It's like, it's the sum of its parts. And it's, you know, so it comes from that 70s, you know, love of bands and seeing our bands, you know, disagree and not get along and then think, oh, that's silly, you know or or not silly or whatever but so there was i think we went into it with a, a sort of some of that egalitarian like yes we're going to share and publishing and we're all going to kind of try to write and you know we're going to try to support each other and you know so it's it's kind of built in but building it in and actually doing it are two different things i mean it's yeah. like so we've you know we've we've learned to compromise with each other and accept each other through many multiple years of ups and downs. And now we can kind of go, well, that we've got through all that. So it just gets easier because you've already gone through so much that the bumps don't seem quite as scary. And you just try to, you know, so yes, I think that that's one of the, <laughs> I think it's one of the biggest feats of the band is like that we stayed a band and then we still all kind of write. And that's like, you know, for it's, 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 it's huge. And I, you know, I think about it, you know, Eddie really um, is an incredible writer, but he really sees the beauty in bands and he's always, you know, you know, we still go in like, who's got a song? We got to go around the circle, like, you know, and we don't always seemingly pick the best song of what is really, you know, it's sometimes somebody's song is not that great, but then we all play it together and then we kind of tinker with it. Then we kind of, then yeah. we all love it because we figured it out together. You know, it's like we got through it or, you know, and then it takes on a life of its own. Sometimes mm -hmm. those songs are favorites of everybody or sometimes they go by the wayside, but we're still invested in that process and all its imperfections because mm -hmm. there's, there's plenty, but um, I'm, that's really, I'm really proud of that about our band for sure. You made, you made a lot of favorites as well. You made a lot of people's favorites. Isn't that weird? Like you've made all these capital S songs. That's rare, dude. That's that's a rare thing. Do you remember the first time that came together? Do you remember the first song that was ended up being huge that felt huge in that moment or felt ridiculous and we don't even know whether it should be on the record? Um 
this is no or- i think i think playing black the first you know i mean i just he just sang it and we just <laughs> that's the arrangement i wrote and then he put this vocal on it and it's like you know how, you couldn't ask for anything better than that in terms of like somebody hearing a melody and then being able to tell a story and then have that story have these symbolic sort of metaphors that really make you kind of you know capture you or sort of it's just you know the, something like that but i think any you know we're ed as a collaborator so he likes to you know and 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 you really are making up something there is some alchemy to it you know that it's just like so or something you know maybe song like daughter or something like that where it's like i just knew from strumming and i was like this is just like these two parts are kind of weird, but they go together and it's like simple, but it's also, you know, it's dark and light and it's, it moves along and it rocks, but it's also acoustic. And, you know, I just knew that it felt good. And then as soon as he started singing the melody, it was like, okay, it's, you know, and he's done that, you know, a lot. <laughs> he does that a lot. He's done that a lot. Like, yeah, you've, you've made, you made an, an astonishing amount of music. Well, okay. Before you became a bandmate and had this relationship and you were just a fan of him, how did you see him as an artist and stuff? You're talking about Eddie? Yeah. 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 Like, cause everyone. You know, we, I didn't, I, we met when we, he came up to try out for the band and that's the first time I met him. Yeah. Were you a fan instantly? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ab- absolutely. And particularly, I mean, one, just the resonance of his voice and sort of the where it sat in a song, like it wasn't normal. It felt like this is this is different. You know, this feels like something, you know, everybody's going high, you go low, you know. Um, so and that he was absolutely just, you know, a sweetheart and personable and, you know, like a good friend to a group right away, like, you know, not uh just being sensitive to the whole group like treating it like a group um and so it was it was good right away you know my understanding of his talents is vastly different than it was then i didn't understand the power of lyric in the way that i understand it now in terms of how the the cadence and the the emotional content of a lyric is such a bigger part of why I liked my favorite songs than I recognized back then. So, yeah. you know, so, you know, he's only gotten more interesting to me as an artist in terms of like, you know, he still surprises me with lyrics, still surprises me with melodies, still surprises me with, uh, with song ideas. And that's super hard. You know, people have <laughs> patterns and things where they do their thing, but it's just kind of the same, you know, and there's elements to all of us that are like that, but he does keep pushing little mm. into new territory yeah. that is he does a great job and you do too like i think all of us are inspired yeah. by him i mean or you know oh, i think really? we all inspire That's each other you know in a way we're all like we all still feel like you know i'm an artist yeah well it feels, like, it. Yeah. It feels like you're an uh, you're avid listeners like if you listen to like the new music and stuff it feels like you have internalized what has happened over you know like as music has evolved you've internalized it which is kind of interesting do you think you have or you just i guess you or you're just coming from a place i think we're doing you've just we're whatever we're all excited about we're all excited about yeah and that's worked out for us you know yeah okay going back to what you said before you all got upset when your favorite bands broke up what which bands were you the most upset about when they broke up um or you know or 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 people you know passing away like yeah. keith moon dying you know or 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 john bonham you know but um little australian nod there little um we did contribute a lot in acdc we did yeah oh my god acdc like you know yeah. bon you know bon acdc was oh, popping on right, rock radio yeah. with bon you know with bon scott like just beginning in the states and it acdc changed completely rearranged my understanding of like what rocks and like how deceptively simple and complex it can be in terms yeah. of their you know and it's you know it's yeah. the blues it's and it's, john bonham and yeah he yeah. asked blues yeah. is what it is yeah john bonham you know that that i mean that band had such a profound impact and was so you know like what about what about them as guitar players and yeah 
And you know, the police. Yeah. How come you broke up? I mean, yeah. like, what's going on? Stuart Copeland, he's like, Sting, you gotta, you're made for each other. It's it's supposed to be. Yeah. But then, you know, you irritate each other and then you gotta, you can't go on tour. You could teach them. You could you could give workshops. Yeah. You just keep, yeah, anyway. Anyway, so back, back to the beginning, because this is what we're all about in the show. Um, it's interesting you're talking about like all of this stuff happening, like like German noise and everyone wanting to make different stuff. I feel like, Okay, just from the outside, obviously I wasn't there in Seattle internalizing this, but it feels like that was the beginning of underground music really spreading, like beyond the radio. Like it feels like, it seems like from what we've, from what I've spoken to people and like a buzz from the Melvins was talking about, he at that point was just digging into stuff and that, you know, there was yeah. tapes and all this stuff and it was kind of spreading. Was that your experience or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's 80s punk rock, yeah. and art scene rock continuing to you know turn more people on that anything's possible you yeah. know so we were part of that we we were activated because there was you know galleries that were having shows where you know you might go to a show on a saturday night at you know uh, impromptu you know something was happening and that it was it, you know it was and it was also touring, I think a lot of young, you know, a lot of art bands and punk rock bands touring and sort of that flyer fanzine sort of do it yourself. And it just, it seeded the ground in Seattle and Seattle just kind of, you know, and start your own label and, you know, and the sub pop of, you know, we're going to conquer the world because why not? Or we, whatever that, you know, bravado that sub pop had in terms of like, you know, total fucking godhead or whatever that sort of you know it that was inspiring in a in a way that made you think anything was possible and that outsider stuff is cool and it has its own heart and you can you know you can find community in uh something that's underground or something that's still forming or and that it could be different or more you know open to people like you you know could be your thing could be your thing you could yeah. be in a band you know you think that that ambition is widespread to the world that crazy ambition that because that is pretty ambitious and that's almost the antithesis to the punk rock thing it's like we're going to be the biggest thing in the world and you look at you know and i read this book with um kurt cobain's manager and he's like yeah he complained and stuff but he really did want to be the biggest band on the world in yeah. some did you guys want to be that did you guys want no. to be I, I mean, I don't think the biggest band in the world was at anyone's motivation in terms yeah. of, you know, that culture, but it was like, hey, we got a van and we're like, two, we got tour dates and we're, we're pressing vinyl and then we got to go, we're going to go to Europe next year because we got invited to play with, you know, um, you know, Squeeze, Quonsa, you know, whatever the, whatever the scenario that made you feel like that person's life sounds fun. I want to do that. I want to go on to, I want to have friends that make art together and that, it generates their community in their life. I want yeah. that, you know? Oh, so, awesome. and so that ambition just gets, and then it was, and then it's sub pop tongue in cheek, taking that same perspective and saying, Hey, you know, we're going to conquer the world, you know, why not? You know, like, you know, so, you know, it, it all kind of feeds into it, but it is ambition and it's uh, entrepreneurial, you know, stuff, but it's also art and it's also, uh, community it's yeah. all those things yeah it's the perfect co coalesce of all those things and i guess when that happens you know interesting magical things happen what um i feel like like it was a movement where music um meant something and um you know eddie came out recently and was talking about <laughs> you know, glam rock and cock rock and that kind of happening at that moment and how much he hates it. <laughs> you know, like, and, you know, I, the guy from Failure was talking about how, like, there were ads in um, the music magazines for band members that said you must have pro hair. I, I don't even know what pro hair. Pro, oh, pro hair, yeah. Pro <laughs> attitude, yeah, pro look, pro, pro hair. Yeah, pro hair. Yeah. pro hair. And I was like, that is amazing. Like, and I feel like that, I mean, it's so gendered and it's so ridiculous and yeah. it's so, it was just such it's a- It's so specific. Thing. It's just too specific. It's like- It's, it's ridiculous and yeah. it's nothing about the playing. And But I, yeah. I kind of feel like, I guess that was happening. That feels like the complete antithesis of what you're talking about. 
Um, and yet, all, you know, you know, I mean, for sure, Jeff and Mike and I loved Hard Rock, you know, like went through it all, you know, like I bought the first, you know, the first Motley Crue leather records, you know, I thought it was at the time it was punk like, you know, it had that same, you know, it was like Motorhead and, you know, there was there was there was things about it that were that I was discovering about, you know, British hard rock at that time that felt also like rebellious or against the norm or something that made me interested in it and it was and I always liked heavy so you know I always liked heavy what was the heaviest shit you were into as a kid sabbath and zeppelin yeah. and you know like no, you know nothing beyond uh you've never gotten into black yeah, and then black. like you know nwa and then moving into sort of like more like industrial sort of heavy you know but it always had to have a song you know totally Tell us about your relationship with Motorhead. I'm curious. I wouldn't have picked a, you know, yeah. You know, they're, for me personally, in terms of they, they were the band that you could see. There was kid, punk kids on the street that had Motorhead things on it. And then the heavy metal kids on the east side also were listening to Motorhead. And that made me go, that doesn't, what, what's going on there? Why is that, you know? And it was undeniably, fucking heavy and undeniably legit so you know and it was that you know tempo you know execution and attitude that combination where it's just you know it gets more undeniable at a certain point and again it's you know it's it's fucking sped up intense blues um but it's 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 you know you're getting turned on to this state of mind that is you know an artistic state of mind it's a it's some you know Lemmy's channeling something in that delivery in his you know aggression um and they wrote good songs yeah you know? totally you I mean you formed a fan community a pretty devout one that has followed you guys for a long time when did it first feel like that was the thing and what we like did you have stickers or did you have like what was what was your DIY stuff when you started out? Like, did you have tapes? Did you? Yeah. That, I mean, that was all Jeff, you know, for the most part to start out with, you know, Ed and Jeff probably together, but even in earlier bands with Jeff, like Green River, it's like, it was always, you know, poster design, you know, artwork, the vinyl, you know, finding the distributor, you know, connecting with the fanzine that you could book a show with in, you know, um, so we just kind of rode his, because he grew up in Montana. So he experienced so much of America through any information he could get in fanzines was one of the ones where he was like, you know, so he, he was already as kind of affiliated with that. So, you know, that was the beginnings of that, you know, and then Ed for sure continued that, you know, in terms of, you know, one being, you know, active politically, you know, making that sort of kind of normal and, and sort of not like kind of building it into kind of what we would do and sort of, you know, uh yeah. that aspect of it as well you that's know. cool that's it's good to use your voice for stuff that's important like being pro-choice and shit like that like it just, never felt like it was like oh my god this is all we do it just felt like hey this is the least we can do is every once in a while just sort of pick something and fucking say something you yeah. know like and that's and that always felt a, appropriate to me that you know there's times where it you know but I think if you look back at our history now, you sort of see a long pattern of, of being involved and in different ways. And, you know, I think really intentionally trying to um, raise awareness and give money away, you know, yeah. consistently as part of our sort of, you know, thing. What are the things that matter to you the most? Like the issues and stuff? What do you think, like what's nearest and dearest to your heart? And maybe as well, something that you've explored in music. I mean, for, I think both, I think in the, in the environment and social justice and the confluence of those two sort of things, which are clearly, you know, we're in a pay attention mode, like we've never been able to, you know, we're, it's so, <laughs> it's the bell is ringing so loud right now that we've got it like, um, you know, so I'm, those are two things that, that, that I'm compelled by and I'm compelled to try to interact with them in in ways that feel appropriate for yeah the most uh 
um, you know, um, what is it? What's the what's the word? Um, it's it's entitled for sure, but um, <laughs> yeah. it feels right. Yeah, it feels. What's the what's the word for my experience as yeah. a guy that just made a bunch quite, of money? Quite fortunate. Yeah, You're I'm very, very fortunate, fortunate that I've You're like. Good. Like, yeah. and I just swung my bat early and made a fortune, good. and and you know I. For a lot, a lot of different reasons, and some of those are the color of my skin and um, the fact that I'm a man, and you know whatever, and all of that makes sense, perfect sense to me. But I, I do, those are two issues that that, that I yeah. think about. Isn't it nuts though that you just totally did that? Isn't it totally cool and nuts that you you when you did you kind of lived the dream? You 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 did. You're still doing it. Isn't yeah. that shit? Like, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's I'm I'm. I'm I'm fascinated by it and um, still sort of grappling with it in terms of my responsibility versus like, you know, what is following your bliss and then following, you know, what you should be following if you were listening to the right voices and what are the right voices and how do you, and then just being a totally flawed human being and still just kind of struggling along, just doing whatever I, you know, I can, this is the best I got. Yeah, it looks, you know, it's pretty good. People are into it, you know, like get it. Um, right. Well, you were part of an inflection point. And I think maybe that that has a lot to do with it. And, you know, most most artists and most people are more involved in a continuum, whereas you kind of came of age and, you know, made your mark at a time that was a real shift, um, a huge shift. And I think, you know, talking about hair metal and all that kind of stuff, it's like there was a huge shift where a different kind of front man was around, you know, and a different kind of social social conscience, a different kind of like humility and a, something being about meaning and something also being about vulnerability. I think there's yeah. enormous vulnerability in the early music. And it, I mean, cont continuously, but in particular at that moment. Um, then there's Jane's Addiction, yeah. which is just like fucking hell, like just changed my life, you know, and it wasn't about humility it wasn't about it was about crazy <laughs> outsider like you know circus you know freak out you know yeah. so which i love too mm -hmm. you know i love that you know I, I i'm like where's the next jane's addiction right now it's like you know thunder just i mean beyond thunderous like rhythm but organic and you know it's mm -hmm. not it's not, uh, you know, programmed. It's, it's, it's not, there's nothing about it that's to a click track. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, which fucking click tracks are great. Don't get me wrong. You know, it, there's lots of great shows out there that are lined up to clicks and it's, and some people can really play to that. And it's, but the organic, like, you know, and Perry Farrell as a singer, it's like, nobody ever told that guy he had a great singing voice. You know what I mean? There's not one, you know, there was no, wasn't one music teacher was, you know, or maybe they did, but they were really great music teachers. You know, they really understood, but like to, to believe in your voice and to believe in your lyric and your perspective to kind of lead that, that takes a lot of courage if you're, you know, and he, and he, you know, accomplished what he showed the path that you can be a singer in a lot of different ways. There's lots of ways to, you know, uh, impart rhythm and lyric and deliver that in a way that is totally real. And nobody will ever question as to whether you're a good singer or not, you know, or, a, you know, you're just delivering, you know, they're jumping up and down. They're yeah. just jumping up and down. They don't need it. Was seeing them live the in like the chain like what made them really cut through for you? Totally, yeah. and you know see, seeing them live, but also you know being drunk and stoned and just going, oh my, you know, just like you know, they were having transcendent sort of you know, uh, yeah. tribal, you know, events, you know, and people whichever them, like the Grateful Dead, didn't they? Like the people followed probably, yeah. uh, probably. I would just see them, you know, periodically, and yeah. And then listen to their records, you know, and just, you know, follow them. So, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's bands like that and X and, you know, like there's just the continuum of all those bands and they are from, you know, from the Sex Pistols on and before, you know, the Ramones and, sh you know, all yeah. the New York early, you know, seventies, like David Bo and then David Bowie, and then you just keep going back and back. And it's just sort of what's, you know, what's, 
who's inspired by that same sort of taking it to a different place? Yeah, well, it's, it's good to go different places. I wouldn't have even picked you as a Mad James Addiction fan, but I think they were, they were I, I read this, I, no, I listened to this great thing where um, Henry Rollins was like, I wasn't a fan when we started the tour. I think it was Lollapalooza, um, but I was definitely a fan by the end of it. Oh my God. Like I was just like, oh, I, I get yeah. it. I get it. Now. Pure groove. I mean, yeah. they were just, their their groove was sick and you know the mel the sing songiness of it and the and the ep just the epic like we're not afraid to play this big simple groove for a whole stadium and it doesn't have to be super complex um i just they just they had the bright elements together they mixed the right colors yeah. together and it was like fucking great does that bring do you take that back to the studio when you're writing like during or is it just something you're appreciating as a listener and it's sort of separate? You got, I think to write songs like Jane's Addiction, you got to just play together. I don't think it's what, I don't think, I mean, I don't know how they wrote, but I'm guessing it wasn't like all totally mapped out. Yeah. You know, that they probably Eric Avery had the bass line and then they just fucking went crazy over the top of it and went, okay, let's use this section, this section, you know, like, but like. That's fun. That was group writing for sure, yeah. you know, in a, in a sense. It's um, I guess yeah. Functional band democracies aren't that, aren't that common. And yeah. sometimes they sometimes it's you know we've 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 suffered from it as, we've suffered from it also. You know, there's times where a producer could walk in and say, "Wait, this is just do this." You know, like this is you know, and we'll meander around and kind of do a bunch of different things that you know. Or we're, you know, or just aligning everybody's energy. So your your natural tendency or your natural strength is being best used in context of the other natural strengths. But then we would have missed out on a lot of a lot of things. Five songs that change your life. Just keeping it easy, just something that's yeah, like, sure, know. please. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um Manic Depression, yeah. you know, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, any of those, like that first time you heard the Hendrix, you know, Foxy Lady, you know, Manic, that first, like, maybe it's like a best of Hendrix, probably. Like, I know I was too young. Um, Gary Wright, for sure. Dreamweaver, those singles. Um, I mean, let's see. I'm just trying to think of like, just really hearing the Sex Pistols, like I've heard them before, but then hearing them one time when I, and I was a freshman in high school. So it was way late. It was like, you know, four years after the Sex Pistols, but somebody, a, a friend of mine had a girlfriend, she had a mohawk and she was playing the Sex Pistols and the Sex Pistols were almost over. And I was just like, you know, probably I was not really giving it. And then she was just outside of the school that we were at and she just had on a blaster and was just cranking. I was like, wow, <laughs> that is the freaking heaviest thing I've ever heard. So, you know, just sort of, those kind of moments where you kind of look back and think, I was so wrong about that. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Seeing X play live at Bumper Shoot. You yeah. Know? They're great. And Jane's Addiction, you know, that like maybe a Jane's Addiction show, you know, those are probably, you know. Um, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. What did you, um, what was the first song you learned to play guitar and were good at? What song was it I learned to yeah, play? What was the song? Yeah, I mean, don't say Smoke on the Water, but like a different one. I don't think I've ever played covers very well at all. So really? I, I don't know that there's, I mean, really? I just. I, I mean, not, yeah, that's really, but most people. I can strum along the chords and I can kind of figure them out, but everybody I know that's really like figures out other people's songs just really understands them in a way that like I'm always like it's kind of this and it's kind of this and it's like so I'm yeah. always just kind of rewriting everybody's songs you know it's annoying you just don't want to borrow it <laughs> I just can't <laughs> <buy> it. <laughs> oh that amuses me well so you were just playing original music from when the time you started playing guitar as soon as I picked up a guitar I was just like I just want yeah. to like yeah that's awesome yeah so it's it's the thing and it's and it's problematic because I think a lot of musicians would go, 
that's the most selfish, like asshole thing. Just like, you're just going to play what you want to play, but you're not going to like really figure out how to play other people's songs. And I kind of, it's kind of true. And I'm, I'm, I'm working through that. <laughs> I don't think me going and taking a bunch of lessons right now is going to be great I mean, though. It's just like, I mean, I'll gonna, be doing this. Yeah. But like, who's I'll gonna, be staring at my fingers, not rocking. Yeah. But, Who's going to teach you, man? Like, who's going to be like, yeah, I'm teaching. Oh, my God. Guitar. I, like, what would, I mean, that'd be a great story for them. You know, it'd, it'd be a great story. I think they'd get more out of it than you, to be honest. I, I could. There's a lot I could learn right now that would be very helpful. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, um, okay, random aside. Well, not a random aside, but a slight left turn. Loose Screw Records. So you started it. Um, I was reading a quite an, an ancient interview um in about 96 talking about how you came off tour in 94 you had a soundproof room in a new house and you're like i want to help like record my friends bands and make stuff happen and, and right. just... so what did you kind of want to do at that point and how has that kind of changed over time and i don't think it's changed at all and i think you know yeah. we did it for a while and it was there's a lot that you know you start to help activate people's dreams and then it's it's you're responsible you know you have this like connection to this personal connection with like a band and maybe a singer and a bass player and a drummer and you're like trying to talk them into being the best they can and then you're also putting money into like trying to figure it out and if it goes one way it's great and if it goes another way maybe it's not so great and it's very it's very complex and I think at one point I just got overwhelmed by the responsibility of it and so but the spirit of it, you know, was really this partnership I wanted to have with Regan Hagar, who is, you know, who I saw in Malfunction, which was like the punk rock band in Seattle because they were fucking punk rock and they played, you know, they played thrash speed metal and they played, you know, Kiss covers or Black Sabbath or, you know, and they were like, perfect. You know, they were like, you know, and hilarious and great. And so, and he taught me so much about art and we were always talking about art and going, we, we got it, we can figure it out or whatever. Hmm. And um, for us to um, have gone through that first round and then kind of gave up on it. And then now in our fifties, looking back, you know, going, hey, let's give it one more shot. And it's the exact same thing. We're just tinkering and like, you know, make, you know, we've been joking about the you know loose groove but the key word is loose i mean it's like you know i'm there and then i'm gone you know it's like it's it's a you know it's possibly problematic <laughs> but luckily we hired a uh we didn't hire we we uh invited billy jean cerullo who works at the orchard to be our partner and now she is the actual brain child of loose groove and she turned us on to tiger cub and um and so we just signed tiger cup which is like this is now we're going now we're getting more real now it's like you know um because this band is freaking awesome and it's you know uh <laughs> this jamie the guitar player and the song and the main songwriter is is he's um i don't know it's you know you say the real deal but it's it's just his riffing and his melodies and you know his his dynamics and his love of art it's very evident so we're just like tickled that we're like um in partnership with him and we're very thankful for revolver for making that announcement um yeah. you know and helping us with that because that's that's so great we love you guys and thank you so much i like i like that video that's a fun uh what, which one is it oh the, i want to get fucked up think, yeah 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 it's, yeah yeah it's it's pretty good. I mean, I, I love, I love it too. You know, it's such a heavy song. We, I almost thought, you know, it's, you know, it's all, everything's understated because it's all inner office, like, you know, like sure. insanity. Yeah. yeah. I almost wanted to convince them to, you know, you gotta, gotta play. I gotta see you play that riff. Yeah. No, they're not, not having a bar of it, which I kind of like it's, it's rebelling. No, no, no totally. I respect it completely. I think what's interesting now is like the, like the youth of today's Gen X's kids, like generations that like almost millennials as, a, yeah, I'm one of them, but like as a group, we're a lot, we're a lot more apathetic and there's something about Gen Z and Gen X that the, the, the do it yourself culture and making your own culture and stuff is quite, is, it's quite a strong lineage. What do you think do it yourself means now and compared to what it meant then? I think there's I, my gut 
feeling tells me there's a lot more room for people really to do it from a technological standpoint. I mean, yeah. like recording and digital and being able to make records remotely and sharing in all kinds of different ways. That's all removing sort of obstacles that have kept people from doing it, but that this sort of the localism is, you know, all those like weird identities that you can kind of develop in a in a local community for a while before it spills out is is limited. So it's 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 maybe it's more um, you know uh, it gets more generic too in a way you know or more you know there's less there's less time for something to really uh, germinate in a particular place and get a character you know like yeah I always think about like like thinking about reggae music and like the confluence of things that came together in Jamaica that that got that thing going which is flipping every groove on its head in some new way and taking these melodies from uh, American radio and and the grooves and uh, and the and again everything is flipped everything is completely up you know and it's the most you know you think of it it's like what an art form was created in that you know yeah. and Joe Strummer, what Joe Strummer did as well to, to yeah, yeah. we can then add totally. and then it's just absorbing that and like yeah. you know so I love those sorts of you know kinds of things and I think it's harder to have that kind of yes the, the germination period is too short and i call it the mono you get, you get called by a hot shot producer like too quickly and then he's like okay but what about to this you know brazilian beat that i picked out yeah. that sounds like four songs on the radio right now well or, it's it's this weird thing of like it's all the culture we have access to all the culture but it also becomes monoculture yeah 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 which is look it yeah. is we can't turn off the tap you there's can't plenty of, there's plenty of room out there to do something fantastic right now i say yeah and that's yeah. exciting yeah yeah okay your musical mount rushmore four faces carved into the stone what are they and my dream is to get all of these done i don't i mean it's probably bad to like a bunch of rock faces to do this but at the same time i want to do it um i've been going to visit my mom who's staying at a healthcare facility in um in um, downtown seattle yeah. and she grew up in the swing era and yeah. um and there's a digital swing channel on her, you know, so every time I go down there, we crank it. And then, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's a really, it's really nice because she's actually, her spirit is lifted by it. And she's like, I can tell it affects her. Um, but listening to that over and over again, it's just like uh, thinking about Duke Ellington and Count Basie and that era of expertise and, collaboration and orchestration and improvisation and um it's just mind-blowing so you know duke ellington cool. and count basie and um billy holiday and and then somebody way left field why not does someone it's uncarved it's just like it, it'll it'll emerge with time uh and devo you yeah. know and then and then put Devo on there too. Devo were, well, Devo were, art, were an art school band, right? Yeah. Yeah, like they were a cool, weird art school band. Yeah, yeah. So. Put on them. Yeah. Put on all make the Don't yeah. make, play all the wrong notes too. Yeah. What, um, what do you turn to, what, when you're like bummed out, what do you listen to? Uh, sports radio. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I feel I listen to it and I go, God, these guys are terrible. They can't play once. Those guys are terrible at sports. And yet all they're doing is, is sort of, um, you know, making judgments about other people's sports. And I just think that's, that's terrible. But I am curious about what they think about that, you know. And it cheers you up. Linebacker from Tennessee <laughs> and whether the Seahawks can somehow manage to get a hold of him. That's my field. I like it. Um, what about when you're like, what about when you're really happy? What are you listening to? I mostly listen to KXP at home and, yeah. you know, NPR and then hip hop, pop radio, you know, like, you know, I like pop music. Yeah. You know, if I'm crank, you know, I'm, I'm always, I think pop music is kind of having a little, for me personally, it's a little bit of a golden era in terms of like, it's, there's a lot of elements that are coming from everywhere that are being sort of interestingly combined with a lyric that either is compelling or it's so 
undeniable in its delivery and its and its rhythm that you can't argue with it even if you don't necessarily think it's poetry poetry or yeah. you know um i we, like i'm i'm interested in that kind of you know who are you the feeling? power of pop music is very interesting to me yeah who are you feeling at the moment what um what artists i mean everything by drake almost always you know <laughs> because of just like how interesting he puts a melody and a beat together in the littlest information i mean it's 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 kind of stunning i think well that's that's great okay he's sticking around he's not going yeah. anywhere drake's not going anywhere at all that's um cardi b's up i just think that's one of the songs i just like her delivery on that is heavy metal like that that heavy metal kids don't think that's the most badass person on the planet you know to me that that's what's heavy she's a fun pop culture figure like she's definitely totally. a piece of pop culture of this time couldn't be more of this time couldn't have really emerged at a different time or maybe could have but there's something about there's something about her that's very 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 timely and um, her just her literal delivery and you know just her delivery it's like you feel this rhythmic and you know you just feel this tension this energy from her that is you know i mean that's like a two-pack verse or you know like i mean it's just like you just know it's just like wow you know sounds like she believes it she found sounds yeah, like totally. it's a completely yeah. incredible piece of art well, even if you know yeah well that's there it is. good what was the soundtrack to your first heartbreak uh probably like um violent femmes or something <laughs> over time over moment yeah like you know like that in like 1980 you yeah. know 1980 and like that that era violent femmes what a great man indeed what was your first what was your first ever concert and what was the first concert that meant something to you randy hansen's tribute to Jimi hendrix randy hansen was like a hendrix tribute guy and he played at the paramount he was big in seattle i think he was a seattle yeah. guy and he did it pretty amazing and it felt like hendrix but i think really i want to say blue oyster cult british lions and ufo at the heck edmondson pavilion with like you know getting busted because i had like you know homegrown weed in my pocket when i got home and like you know well, you go they, had they had laser shows back then they would shine off the they'd shoot lasers up into the mirror ball and then just lasers would go everywhere and i think it's totally illegal to do that now it's like completely the 70s it was like oh it shouldn't affect our eyes i don't think it's gonna hurt anyone i was gonna but, say like would you ever do that shoot lasers lasers into pimples I, if, really I don't i think like it's it. actually i would in a second because it was yeah. the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life but i think it's actually illegal you somebody will allowed. somebody will correct me if i'm wrong but i think that it's i don't think you can shoot lasers i think you can shoot them up now yeah i don't think you're allowed to like blast them into the mirror ball. that was definitely like the dude who was like you want to see something badass check this out that's Damn. that's yeah look a lot of a lot of stuff used to be allowed. Yeah. Not allowed. Yeah. You know, it's a weird time. Like yeah. I wish it was chiller. I wish I don't know. I don't like rules. I don't care for rules. What yeah. what's your favorite rule you've broken? Um I mean it's not my favorite, but it's I think just kind of not, I mean, I guess I don't know. Being in the Hall of Fame for bands and not really knowing how to play guitar, I think it's <laughs> that's is that weird a little bit it is a, that is pretty that is pretty nuts you know although it's starting to get cooler in there like they're starting to get a lot more like i'm like i'm i'm into them being in there that's sick yeah who was in that who was in there i don't know i think I, is Iggy pop in there am i just am yeah, I, I think so yeah i think you know they're running you know we're i think ours you know it's it's they're running out of you know it's it's turning into a it's turning into a thing. I mean, I I appreciate being in there, but I I don't take it all that. Well, it has it has um. You have to have been around twenty five years to be. Yeah. That's weird. Dolly Parton finally they let Kiss in. I knew once they let Kiss in, I was like, okay, well, because how can you deny Kiss? It's like, yeah. okay, yeah, you either you don't like them or you do like them, but like, <laughs> I'm not gonna Hall of Fame, man. Hall of Fame. 
for me, Kiss, you had to get into at a certain point. And if the yeah. first exposure, my first exposure to Kiss was Gene Simmons and a reality show. Oh, I, I like, and everyone, oh, everyone I talk to on this show is like, Kiss, dude. And that is a terrible, my, my oh, way no, of no, knowing no. what Kiss was is oh, no. the worst way. It's, I'm it's, sure it's all about that. the New York 1974, oh, like, what did Ace they do? Freely. It was this, yeah, they changed the world. Ace Freely was the thing, yeah. it was the whole thing. And that- Wicked Pillows. You had to like get into it at a time. And um, yeah. well, I think um, it's been really interesting. Well, I appreciate your yeah. interview style. Thanks for letting me be verbose. I'm I'm all about the verbose. It's um okay. it's a fun time. It, and you know it's it's always interesting to see the artists that made someone, and um, that's the point of this show. So, well, I had a great time. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank I really you. appreciate it. This is the Revolver Fan First podcast. This is Stone Goss out of Pearl Jam. You know he's pretty great. It was a good time. <laughs>